We have a questioner on this side. Uh, this question is for Professor Aite. With the figures you gave, it sounds that the corruption problem is much larger than aid. If aid stops, won't the people suffering from the corrupt government suffer further from that corruption? Well, I think your question supplies its own answer. And that is, if corrupt governments <clears throat> are making poverty worse, and I think the object of aid is to try and remove those corrupt governments and not to hand money over to them and sort of strengthen them. Because we know in the past, foreign aid simply propped up these bad governments. As a fourth generation South African and African, people often talk about a Marshall Plan. Discussing this with my African colleagues is often met as a suggestion of utter nonsense, or it's met as a suggestion that's needed. It's also been echoed by many US leaders as something that Africa needs. Is this part of the solution? The Marshall Plan is actually an interesting example for many reasons, because that actually worked out to, just for reference, $85 per European per year in constant dollar terms. That was to a rich country doing a, a bunch of stuff after a war. We give uh, you know, a fraction of that to Africa, which has much deeper needs and uh, much deeper poverty today, when we give uh, support totally of $30 per capita. But in terms of your last question of the exclusion from where the aid goes, it actually answers the Marshall Plan point too. I think the basic proposition has to be that the Africans are empowered, the African countries, the societies within those countries are empowered to put forward their own plans, to put in action their own proposals. That's actually what's happened with the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB, and Malaria. The countries put forward their proposals, they submit the proposal to the pool of funds, and then the funding actually is made available to finance that proposal. That's how we've got so many people on antiretroviral treatment. That's how we've got tens of millions of bed nets distributed. That's how we've got millions of uh, people on tuberculosis treatment as well. It's that notion of supporting the African countries, just like in Malawi, and just like has happened all around the world, to put in action their own plans. Someone on the pro side? Yeah. Um, let me do it, if David, I may. David Reef. The, the um, I, I I think the Marshall Plan is precisely interesting because it it comes back to the point that George Aite keeps making, and and I think is the essential point, which is the point of the state. The problem with the Marshall Plan, John, is not that it was eighty-five dollars to a small number of states rather than thirty dollars. It was that there are functioning states there to administer it. The Marshall Plan would have had no hope whatsoever of working historically had the allied powers in the aftermath of World War II not reestablished the German state, for one thing. It was the first thing that they did when they arrived. So you cannot get around this question that I say George Aita keeps raising, which is you are talking, and it gets very fluid here. The answer was, well, societies, countries, well, what do we mean? What is going to happen? Are you going to shoot your way in if you don't like the state? Uh, I mean, society's country, I mean, we talk all this, I mean, civil society is a descriptive term that keeps being min misused in, a, in the NGO world as a, as a, sorry, descriptive term, misused as a prescriptive term all the time. It's not as if civil society can stand up to the power of the state like that. So that, you know, these, these models seem to me to avoid the problem because precisely people don't want to talk about politics, precisely because I think with all due respect, the mistake that both particularly U.S. NGOs and the U.N. system make over and over again is the idea that, as I believe one, either Gail or John put it, you can ring fence aid from politics. You can't. Okay, let me, may I? Because I, I, I have a trouble, a problem with this motion because it's not very scientific. I mean, what is aid? There's U.S. government aid. There are billions of dollars in aid. There's the Gates Foundation. The prize that C-Pain mentioned that was given to President Shisano of Mozambique was given by an African foundation. That was African aid, if you will, or African philanthropy. But I, I think there are a, a, so a, a number of things that are being conflated, and these tools can be used effectively or ineffectively, but they're not all the same, and some have constraints on them and some don't. I, I think also on the, on the Marshall Plan, there's something we're ignoring here. We're, again, we are suggesting somehow that aid is like the invention of the wheel, and that aid is going to be the thing that transforms 
Africa. And I, and I think if we all thought about it, we would reject that, but the way we're discussing it suggests otherwise. The Marshall Plan, yes, had to do with reestablishing states. It also had a lot to do with policy. It wasn't just aid. There were policies regarding the terms of trade and other things that were afforded Europe that have not been afforded Africa. So let's not hold aid accountable for the fact that the terms of trade are skewed against Africa. Our the time, last, is, the our last, time, is, time is starting to run very okay, short. Just but very if, you're quickly, gonna, if you're going to make a distinction between government aid and private aid, like from the Gates Foundation, what is that distinction, very briefly? And can private aid do things that government aid cannot? Yes, I think private aid is much, much more flexible. At, at one level, you're right, David. I mean, government aid is always going to have, to some extent, politics, but also taxpayer accountability over it, assuming that that's something we can achieve again sure. in the near term. Is there any comment? I, I, but, but I have to make one point here. I think it is a gross disservice to Africa to suggest that all African governments are corrupt, that every leader is, is evil, that there are no African states. Africa is a very, very diverse place. And to that young woman who is 18 or 19 years old in Ghana or Zambia or even Zimbabwe who hopes to go to work in a government ministry to serve her people, I think we need to be a little bit careful about suggesting that all governments in Africa are bad because, God forbid, if they don't have governments, it all looks like some There were 18-year-old women in Stalin's Russia right. who had the same ambitions. David, I don't see the point of that, really. But, just 30 seconds on private the, aid. The is, there any com is there any common ground there? Is Gates Foundation well, aid? You know, it used to be said in the 90s when George Soros had more money that he did what the United States didn't have the money to do. I think this is quite a, an interlocking net of institutions. Aid is a system. It's an international system. And the idea that somehow you can say, well, governments, that's not good, but somehow Gates or Soros. The truth is, this is one system. And again, it's, it's a system that doesn't work. OK, one more question from the floor. System. Who's got it? Yes, uh, Bill Hartung from the New America Foundation. There was brief mention of things like military aid, arms trade, war. So I figured I'd have a nice narrow question for the last one. Um, do you think that aid, military or economic, can be part of a platform, can contribute to an effort to reduce conflict in Africa? Generally, when, when, when you talk about foreign aid, of course, there are several types of aid. There is humanitarian aid, uh, assistance, relief, like you know, those that uh, uh, the rich uh, countries sent out to victims of earthquakes and flooding and that sort of thing, humanitarian aid. And then there's military aid. And then there's official development assistance, ODA. Uh, that is what uh, technically is called development aid. And I think this question is about that type of uh, assistance. One minute from this side. Yeah, can I just say, I think it's important to keep in mind uh, how poor much of Africa is. So it's actually not the right comparison to compare to Europe, which was, you know, poorest country was maybe $5,000 per capita uh, 50 years ago, 60 years ago. We're talking about countries at $200 per capita, where a bed net or $8 for a school fee makes a big difference. So if you want to actually uh, prevent conflict in places where the rains fail and people fight and conflict is uh, exacerbated when the rains fail because there's not enough food, I would support fertilizer and seeds to grow more food. This is a really practical point. I think we need to understand also that there are so many countries with great governments, and if there are 16 or 18 or 25 or however many where we can all agree the governments are fantastic, if it's just about governance, why aren't those countries just taking off all across Africa? Why aren't we seeing 10% growth all across Africa? Because there's more to it, and even the most heroic leaders in Africa, in Mali, in Burkina Faso, in Tanzania, in Malawi. They're all facing deep challenges of extreme poverty where people have no money, they can't afford a bed net, they can't afford a $25 bag of fertilizer, a $10 can of seeds, and they're too poor to get on that first rung of the ladder of economic development. And aid can help do that, it's not enough to do that, but we have to understand what it is trying to achieve, and I think 1.3 million people on antiretrovirals is a pretty good start.